Well, shalom from the top of Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel, one of my favorite places, not only in the Bible, but in the land of Israel, of course. Carmel in Hebrew is actually a combination of two Hebrew words, Kerem El, the vineyard of God. It's always been a symbol of prosperity, tranquility, and fertility in the scriptures. That is exactly why many times the prophets will say, you should be like Mount Carmel when they wanted to bless someone to be fertile and prosperous and tranquil. And uh, we hear in more than one uh, of the prophets how green Mount Carmel was there. And the prophet Jeremiah speaking of grazing on the pastures or the greens of, on Mount Carmel. Uh, the prophet Isaiah spoke in chapter 35 of the glory and the majesty of Mount Carmel. And we know that definitely we are talking about a symbol of something good a symbol of the blessing of the Lord. And it's very interesting that Mount Carmel, which is, by the way, 25 miles long, 5 miles wide as a range, 1,700 foot above the sea level. It's not the highest mountain in Israel, not at all. But it stands in a very beautiful and strategic position, towering all the way from the Mediterranean all the way into the Jezreel Valley, which is right behind me. The Jezreel Valley, known to many Christians as the Valley of Armageddon. And Mount Carmel was actually the territory of the tribe of Asher. However, down below, there were several other tribes. The tribe of Zebulun, the tribe of Issachar, and the tribe of Menashe were in this area. From one point, you can actually take a look and see four of the 12 tribes of Israel. Quite amazing. That tells you of not only the strategic location, but of the, the commanding view that that mountain had. Not only towards the north, towards the west, but certainly towards the east, towards the valley itself, towards Jordan and in that area. And so we're speaking of a very, very important mountain, very important uh, place in the scriptures, both in Old and New Testament. And uh, our story this morning takes us all the way to the time that the children of Israel had already kings, flesh and blood, reigning over them. We all remember that when Samuel was the prophet, towards the end of Samuel's life, the children of Israel were actually demanding a king, flesh and blood. We know that they used the excuse of having Samuel's sons being not fit uh, uh, to, uh, to take the position of uh, the leaders of the land. And in a very interesting way, the children of Israel didn't want any more a religious leader. They wanted actually a political leader. And uh, a, a, a new position was born. A king just like all the others had. Bear in mind, every time the children of Israel wanted to be just like everybody else, they always fell in that snare that that, that that was the biggest downfall in history. Even today, by the way, every time we want to be accepted by the nations, every time we want to be just like all the others, we tend to compromise and we tend to actually throw away our significant identity in God's word and in God's plan. So we're coming to the point where the children of Israel are now um, choosing a king and we know that the first one was King Saul who was not really fit to to reign but the only good thing about him maybe was his looks. We're talking about a very tall and handsome man. Then we know that David became the king and David was a king after God's own heart. He wasn't perfect David, we know, sinned and actually committed a very, very tragic sin uh, just when he became the king, finally, uh, from just standing there on the rooftop of his palace, just when everything was right, when everything was finally okay, um, the enemy got him there. But David's heart was always, 
you know, to serve the Lord and he, he confessed his sin and he came clean and, and God forgave him. And there were consequences for that sin, but nevertheless, David continued to be a man after God's own heart. And, and after David came Solomon, which we know he started well, but mm, I guess when you have more than 800 mother-in-laws, how, <laughs> how normal can you be? And, and that, of course, we know Solomon started well, but didn't end up well. And then, of course, ladies and gentlemen, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, became the king of Israel. And Rehoboam realized that he must get the support of the people or else he will not be able to effectively rule them. But there's two ways to get the support of the people. There is the way of listening to them, understanding their needs, taking care of business as government should, or there's a way of ignoring, imposing your will and making sure that by the the power of the iron fist, they will actually fear you and that will cause uh, them to, to serve you in a more effective way. We all know that he came to the people of Israel and he said to them, my father whip you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. In other words, life is not going to be easier with me. I'll actually be worse than my father was. And if you complain about my father, wait until you see what I have for you. And that is, of course, the point where the children of Israel said, well, if that's the case, adios, amigos. And uh, the kingdom split. The kingdom split. And uh, we also know from the book of 1 Kings that Rehoboam did not do well in the sight of the Lord. We know that Rehoboam... Um, um, wasn't really serving God. He didn't have the right heart. And, and that caused God to bring upon Israel um, Shishak, the Pharaoh of Egypt, who came and, and actually took over uh, much of the treasures of the temple. The Bible says uh, in 1 Kings chapter 14, in verse 25, it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and took away everything. And that, of course, because of what's written in verse 22 that says uh, before that, Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they committed more than all that their fathers had done. Can you imagine? Children of Israel had done so much uh, evil in the sight of the Lord, and, and yet now when they have everything, now when they have a king, now when they have a kingdom, now when they dwell safely, now when the kingdom of Solomon was the largest ever in their history, so they have a lot of land, a lot of territory, a lot of you know, treasures, now they actually do evil more than any other time before. And no wonder why God allowed their enemies to come and take all the treasures. And that is, of course, what we hear in, in, in that story. But, but again, we have to remember one of the most difficult things that happened in the land of Israel at that time was that the kingdom split and ten tribes followed a man called Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And Jeroboam said in his heart the following thing. In verse 27, If these people of my kingdom, yes, go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of these people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, the king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Isn't that amazing? All he cared about is that he will lose the people and they will go back to their, I would say, legal king, if anything. And look what he did. Therefore the king asked advice. He made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, now listen to this. We all remember what the children of Israel had right below Mount Sinai and how they described the golden calf. But look what he said. He said this. To the people of Israel. It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods. 
O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel and the other one in Dan. And it became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Levi. Of course, the Levites remained in Jerusalem. So he had no Levites there. And now he just, uh, you know, contracted that position and gave it to anyone he could. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th year of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he really followed the real dates, and he tried to make them feel that they're doing the right thing. The people were fooled, the people were deceived, that they are actually worshiping God the right way. And that is why the Bible says that Jeroboam was so bad. No, he was, no one was as bad as Jeroboam. You don't want your name to be mentioned in the Bible in that context. And of course, after Jeroboam came more kings and none of them was really good. But then we're introduced to a new king. And he went a step further. We're introduced in the... 1 King chapter 16 in verse 29, in the 38th year of Asa, the king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Wow. If that wasn't enough... Look, this guy goes a step further, and look what he did. He said that he did this, and it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Etbal, king of the Sidonians. That says Sidon is a city in Lebanon today. And remember, the prophets always warned that from the north the evil shall come. Many of the Babylonian deities eventually made it through Lebanon into Israel. That was part of what we call the Fertile Crescent. That was the main road. So it came from Babylon and Assyria up towards the Turkish area, down through Lebanon, Syria and Lebanon, into the land of Israel. Indeed, from the north the evil came. That may explain to you why that cave in the area of Caesarea Philippi was known by the local as the gates of hell. It was facing the north. And so, here we are. The Bible says that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Etbal, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now watch this. Everybody really kind of Blame Jezebel for every, every, everything. The spirit of Jezebel and all of that. And that's fine. But look at the active approach, not the passive approach of this king. He went and worshipped Baal. He's the king. And he went and worshipped Baal. You know, sometimes leaders of the world might be passive and allow some stuff to happen and maybe turn blind eye. And It's another thing when that leader actively worship something else because that will lead the whole nation to destruction and watch this the bible says and it came to pass not only that he worshiped him that he set up an altar for baal in the temple of baal which he had built in samaria you know in lebanon there is a town called baal bek it there's a town named after baal they used to worship Baal there. Now what did he do? He imported the worship of Baal and literally built a temple for Baal. Where? In Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days... Chiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation with Abiram, his firstborn, and with his youngest son, Segub, 
he set up its gates according to the word of the Lord, which he spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. If you remember when Joshua came and took Jericho and destroyed it, in Joshua chapter 6, verse 26, he said that cursed will be the one who is going to rebuild the city. His firstborn will build it and his last will even place their, the doors there. And we see it had to take a cursed king for a cursed man to do a cursed thing. That, that shows you a whole pattern of how Israel did everything wrong, going all the way back to that which God could, could see that they're going to do even in the days of Joshua. Wow. And so, Elijah, the Tishbite, of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel, in chapter 17, lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, except at my word. And then he said, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here, and turn eastwards, and hide in the brook Kerit, which flows unto the Jordan. So we can clearly see that Elijah the prophet, for the first time introduced to us in chapter 17 of 1 King, understand that the drought that the land of Israel is going through is directly related to the spiritual state of the nation. I'll make it very clear. Many nature disasters, many famines and pestilences, many droughts are indeed related, related directly to the sinful state of a nation or even of the whole world. I'm being reminded of that which the Bible is telling us in Romans chapter 8 in verse 22. It says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The rapture. The redemption of our body. We are eagerly waiting for the redemption of our body, but not only we, the whole creation. And what we see as far as nature disasters are part of what the Bible says in Romans 8, birth pangs. And that, of course, related to the spiritual dark state of the world. And so, now we come to chapter 18. That was just the introduction. Now we, we come to our chapter. And I need you to understand that it's, an, it's a horrible feeling to think that you're the only one who, do, who is doing the right thing. And not because you're perfect, because God tells you, God talks to you, God speaks through you. You know, the prophets in those days, let me tell you, were not people of calmliness and easygoing. They were on Prozac if they could. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just saying, think about it. They never really said what they wanted to say. God spoke through them. They were very, I call it tragic, Figures. I, I, can, I can quote to you 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. It says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't their will. It wasn't their intention. It wasn't their stuff, their thing. They were tormented people. They were on highs and lows more than any other person. But God spoke through them. They were conduits through which God is speaking. God, the Holy Spirit, speaks through them. And it is a terrible feeling to think, man, God speaks through me. Nobody is listening. But take a look around you. People are just celebrating as if it's 1999. And I want you to know that 
There was a strong famine. The Bible says in chapter 18, came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain to the earth. In other words, God said to Elijah, I know you don't like Ahab and I have surely he doesn't like you, but you need to go and confront him or else there will be no rain. If you go and confront him, I will send rain. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab and there was a severe famine in Samaria. Now, make sure you understand, and this is important. It's, it's sort of a vicious cycle. Think about it. There's famine in the land. You would think that the famine would cause the people to get right with the Lord because they know that the rain comes as a blessing from God. But what is it that they do? Instead of worshiping the Lord, they said, well, if there's famine, we need to worship the goddess of fertility and the god of rain, Ashtaroth and Baal. Instead of worshiping the Lord God of Israel, they are so spiritually blinded that actually they blaspheme God who can actually stop that by worshiping other gods. Now, that is an, an amazing picture of what the future is going to be during the tribulation. Allow me to take you to Revelation 16. And in Revelation 16, the Bible says in verse 8, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the power was given to him to scourge men with fire. And men were scourged with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Isn't that amazing? You see, the world is going to be so deceived by the Antichrist that instead of understanding and knowing that God has the power of these things, that God sends it, what do they do? They blaspheme and they do not repent. And this is the power of a king, of a ruler, of a leader. He can cause a whole nation to be completely deceived and blind. Do I need to tell you? Do I need to tell Americans in, in the year 2016 what it means for a nation to be deceived and blinded by, by a regime and president? All I'm saying is that the power of a leader can deceive tremendously a whole nation. Now, of course, just like Elijah, there's always those few that God leaves that will not bow to the Baal. But unfortunately, they are minority and remnant. Now watch this. Chapter 18, in verse 17, it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Now isn't it interesting that always those idol worshippers will look at godly people as the troublemakers? Mm -hmm. Always those who go other other gods, other deities, other idols will look at godly people as a problem. You know that, by the way, if you want an indication of you going the wrong way, is that when you start feeling uncomfortable next to godly people. Yeah, amen. When you start feeling uncomfortable at church, when you start feeling uncomfortable next to other believers, when you start feeling uncomfortable praying, you are in a very bad territory. That means you're in the wrong way. And, that, and then the, the road to accuse those people as the troublemakers is very short. And I can tell you one thing. Once the rapture will take place, everybody will say, God, good, good, good written. Everybody will, will say, these are the troublemakers. Because of them, the world looks so bad. Because of them, people don't have the freedom they need. Because of them, we are so primitive. We're so backward. I mean, now God... Thank God they're gone. Now we really can be progressive and do things the right way. They will be dancing in the streets, I guess. Think for a minute. And, and, and we can clearly see that Elijah is not afraid. What a bold man. He stands right in front of the king of Israel and he says, to him, I have not troubled Israel, 
but you and your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now watch this. Not only that he's giving a, a certain number of both Baal and Asherah, those who worship the god of rain, Baal, and those who worship the goddess of fertility, Asherah, from which Ashtaroth came and Ishtar and then Easter. And that's why you have bunnies and eggs in Easter. <laughs> Symbol of fertility, by the way. Has nothing to do with Christ at all. And it's interesting because what did he say? He said not only that you tolerate those, you actually have them eating at the table of your wife. Yeah. That means that the leader surrounds himself with people that he prefers, that he feels comfortable with. And an ungodly man will never feel comfortable next to godly people. He will always surround himself with people of that same nature. And this is why the Bible begins the book of Psalms with, with something very, very distinct. He says, blessed is the man. You see, a blessing is coming when you walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of or scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law is, he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth the fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. And then it ends up with the ungodly. And it says, they shall perish. You see, the beginning is blessed, and the last is they shall perish. It starts with blessing, it ends up with perishing. If you're walking in the ways of the Lord, you'll be blessed. If you're ungodly, you'll perish. And interestingly enough, now we come to the point where Elijah the prophet is summoning everyone to the top of Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel, which is the symbol of God's blessing, prosperity, tranquility, and fertility, is now the gathering place of three different parties. One, Elijah. Two, the people of Israel. Three, the prophets of Baal and Asherah. Make sure you understand. Because Elijah is not even talking to the prophets. Wow. You see, he, they already chose their way. They already have their way. Uh -huh. they, he's not there to persuade them. Yeah. See, now all of them are on Mount Carmel. And they have sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel, and Elijah came to all the people, not to the prophets, and he said to the people, and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. What did Jesus say about being lukewarm? Remember? Exactly, I'll spit him out of the mouth. Which means... Either cold or warm. If you're not with me, you are against me. So you can't sit on the fence and you can't just wet your finger and see where the wind is blowing and decide then, okay, I'll go today here, tomorrow there. I know so many people, so many people are like that. They don't have that deep roots in the Bible and deep roots in, the, in, in doctrine. Every time somebody comes with a new theory, Every time some, something exciting goes on, they'll be following it. And, and, and Elijah is, is challenging the people. Bear in mind, he's talking to the people. How long will you falter between the two opinions? Make up your mind and make up your mind today. If you want to see rain, if you want to see the blessing of God, make up your mind. And it's interesting because the people answered him not a word wow really 
They were convicted and they had nothing to say. Literally, they had nothing to say. Why? Because they know they really don't follow God. And they know that they are there as spectators to see who wins. And they'll follow the winner. That's all. So they're there to watch. All right? Now watch this. They answered him not. And Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophet are 450 men, and therefore let them give us two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bull, and I will let it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. This is why the monastery here is called Muhraka in the Arabic, the place of the fire. Oh. It's all about the fire. Yeah. It's interesting because I know a monk that uh, lived here, and, and there was a, a Christmas Eve a few years ago, and you've seen lightning in Israel. Yeah. You know, they can be intense. <laughs> and a lightning hit the top of the roof and cut a round stone that was holding the cross Whoa. in two. And the half that holds the cross is still there, the other half fell, and the monk took off and ran away. Wow. He was so scared. And I asked him, what are you scared of? Are you okay with God? <laughs> I mean, shouldn't be scared. But that tells you, if just one lightning, can you imagine what it could be if the fire of God came down? Now watch this. All the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, now he speaks to them. Choose one bull for yourself and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given to them and they prepared it. And called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. And then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he's meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping, must be awakened. So they cried aloud and not only cried aloud, you know, one of the things that cults normally do, and we see that even in the Shiite Islam, when they want to get the attention of their god, they actually start taking knives or, or, or some lenses and, and start cutting themselves until they bleed so the blood may enhance the whole thing and in that trance of bleeding and crying and, wow. and singing. By the way, there's, there's Catholic ceremonies just like that. I know that for a fact. Uh, there, there's parades of Catholics in certain holidays where they actually do that to themselves. And then the Shiite Muslims do that. It's called Ashura. And, and so here, the prophets of, of, of Baal are cutting themselves and blood started gushing and yet nothing happened. And when midday was, midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. The Bible says that these people have gods, but they may have mouth that they cannot speak. It's just dead. So Elijah said to the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And then with the stones he built an, al an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seas of seeds. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood and said, Fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Elijah is basically blocking any, any possible chance that they will blame the fire on the hot weather. By what? By soaking everything, the wood and the bull with water. And bear in mind, where can you get water? That's why we believe we're in the right place. The only place on Mount Carmel in this area high enough to see both the ocean, Mediterranean, and the Kishon Spring, or Kishon Crook, uh, the Kishon Brook down below, is that place where the monastery from 1883 is standing today. 
And it's interesting because down below we found a, a, a well that had water even then. And so he brought the water and he soaked the water, uh, I mean, he soaked the altar and he soaked the wood. And now Elijah said the following thing. He said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And now when all the people, not the prophets, all the people, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah told them, the people, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let anyone escape. So they seized them, and brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. See, there was no rain. Not even a sound of rain. But there was a promise. The promise from God. Go and meet Ahab and I will send rain. So Elijah, in, in that amazing act of faith, and that boldness that could only come from above is challenging the king, although he saw no cloud. What faith! What amazing, amazing boldness. And he says, a sound of abundance of rain. Can you imagine the, the sky is clear, not even a single cloud, and he says to him, there's sound of abundance of rain. Probably Ahab thought that Elijah is on drugs or something. And, 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 think, up, and think about it for a second. Elijah went up on top of Carmel, he bowed down on the ground, and he put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. And as you can see where we are, we're in a viewpoint that you can see the sea on one side, and the valley where the brook Kishon is on the other side. So he says, Go and look. He didn't even want to look. He's praying, you go and look. Sometimes, we pray and pray and we just let others check and see if something happened. And go and look. And he went one time, second time. How many times did he have to look? Seven, Seven times. Man, what a, an amazing faith. Six times the guy came down and he thought that Elijah is really on drugs. <laughs> Nothing. The seventh time. It happened, the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. But, but of course, before that, what did he say? He kind of saw a little cloud in the size of man's hand coming in verse 44 towards him. And then he says, Go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. It happened. In the meantime, the sky became black with clouds and wind. and There was a heavy, heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Jezreel, in the middle of the Jezreel Valley. That's what we call it, the Jezreel Valley. And then, of course, the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Man, he ran ahead. The guy was in shape, <laughs> up and down, up and down on mountains, and he ran ahead of a chariot. That reminds me of what the Bible says about the children of Israel, that he bore them on eagles' wings. Hmm. Wow. And we're, and, and we're surprised that God took him up when... Already while he was here, there were some unbelievable events. Eventually, we know that the story ended with Elijah being rewarded in ways that only two people in the Old Testament had gone through. Enoch and Elijah were speaking of people who never saw corruption. They never died and they were taken up to heaven. 
And this is an amazing reward to someone who had an amazing life. You know, the fire of God once again is going to come during the, the trial when Messiah will come back. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. How do we want to stand before Christ when the day comes? When he tests all of that we did and said, do we want to be rewarded? Because what do we do with that reward? We lay down at his feet. Or do we want to just be saved as through fire with nothing in our hands to give him as a gift? And so that fire of God that came and tested the hearts of the people of Israel. I hope that every one of us believers will understand that everything we do and say, all of the hidden intentions of our hearts, one day will be revealed through the fire. And I hope and pray that the day will come when Jesus will tell me and you, well done, good and faithful servant. May we all remember the story of the fire of God that happened here on Mount Carmel. And may we all remember that all of our lives are just one big Mount Carmel full of blessings of the Lord. Yet the fire will test everything in, when the time comes. May God give us the strength to go through these lives living for Him and having the Holy Spirit directing our steps and that everything we do and say will give Him glory and honor and will usher our way into His kingdom. God bless you.